Phil Penny, Center for the Arts, uh, this wonderful afternoon where uh, the weather for a change gives us all a break to be here. Uh, uh, the timing of Lucas Foss throughout his whole life was ironic. This, uh, this concert was initially scheduled as a, as a tribute to the music of Lucas Foss. And Lucas had an idea last week that it was time to take his dear part. And so we miss him dearly. Uh, so the, the concert has become a commemoration of the life of Lucas Foss as much as the music of Lucas Foss. And all of it put together uh, with the heart and soul involved of, of Charlie Haupt and, and, um, and several of his other closest friends. Uh, time is always of the essence. Indeed, the, the title for the subtitle for this whole festival is called Time Cycle, which is a, a piece we're going to hear uh, this afternoon. And so, but keeping in mind that time flies, and we don't have much of it, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask each of the uh, members of the panel here uh, to give a, a one or two minute capsule of uh, one of their memories of Lucas uh, along the way. And by the way, I should introduce myself. I'm, I'm Ed Yatsinski from the, from the Philharmonic, uh, but I worked closely with Lucas as a chamber player as well for many years. Uh, day one for Lucas Foss uh, in Buffalo on the podium of the Philharmonic, but by coincidence was day one for me in the clarinet section of the BPO, so I was in a very good spot to see it all begin. I'd, I'd like to begin on my far left. We have Nils Bigelin, uh, composer, Buffalo composer, and faculty of Manhattan School. Nils, would you uh, share? I'd like to remember Lucas as a teacher. I had the good fortune of studying with him in 1971 when he was a guest professor at Harvard. In those days, there were no private lessons. It was a seminar. So you might have, you might have everyone from a trembling freshman to a grad student on Social Security. Uh, and uh, there were oftentimes 15 to 20 people in the room. This was Lucas's element. Uh, the quality of his teaching was uh, an immediate response to your work. And in all teaching situations, it's a trust situation. You have to trust what the person says to you, and uh, you have to accept it. Uh, that's really how it works. And so what he would do is he would usually play through the work if you didn't volunteer to do it. And he would say, this captivates uh, my imagination. This is what I think uh, is the core of your work. And I can still recall the first time he did this, he pointed to a small passage. And basically what he was saying is, given my experience, given what I know about music, this is where I think you are. And then it was your turn to go home and stew on this and figure out, well, why did he pick out those measures? <laughs> uh, but after you did that, you were then struck by, I think, the other thing that I will always remember by him is that this was an act of generosity. Because it's often the case uh, in teaching that you're not quite sure if the teacher's there because they want to be there or because uh, they're being paid to. And what Lucas communicated to you was that he actually liked what you had done. And this is the thing I will always remember by him, his generosity. When he gave you that comment, it came simply because he loved music, and he found something there that he felt was special. God bless him. What a world else. Thank you, Bill. Charlie. Charlie Haupt is our, I call him Charlie, forgive me, uh, but uh, Charles was our concertmaster for many years, and uh, I had the wonderful good luck to work as a chamber player with Charlie many times over the years, and many programs with Lucas uh, in Europe and, uh, and here in the United States. Charlie. I worked with Lucas for 15 years, both as a creative associate and as concertmaster of the BPO before he left, and of course, and many conductors after that. And the aspect of Lucas that stands out most generously in my mind is the fact that he was the most extraordinarily flexible musician. He was open to suggestions from everybody. He did not take position or class or notoriety into consideration when he considered other people's opinions. He took them at face value and tried to co 
work Nathan was the kind of work that he was interested in doing, and in any way that these comments could improve his work, or somehow enlighten him towards other aspects of his own work, he would hearken unto that extraordinary gift. He was incredibly a genius and had absolutely no respect for tradition whatsoever. I mean, how can you have respect for tradition if you bring a mandolin into the Messiah? <laughs> to play the pastoral symphony, he played the, the pastoral symphony, he used the mandolin. <laughs> That's a non sequitur, there's nothing to say after that. <laughs> that sums up Lucas in, in a nutshell. I mean, there, was, there was nothing that stopped him from doing anything that he thought was interesting, new, creative, and ingenious, and most importantly, would add something that the composer himself would like, or have, would have enjoyed listening to. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> Excellent. <clears throat> that wonderful memoir there. Uh, Jerry Kirkbride on my left, a fine clarinetist. I, we uh, had good fortune of playing chamber music, and also uh, Jerry joined us uh, on, the, uh, on this section of the, uh, the Buffalo Philharmonic. Uh, I think in even a couple of our early recordings, Jerry, yes, if I, I remember. Think so. yeah. Remember, and he's at Arizona, uh, the University of Arizona right now, professor of clarinet. Jerry, I, I know that Lucas meant a lot to you along the way. Lucas was very much a part of my life for many, many years, and he entered my life probably earlier than any of anybody else on this panel, only because I was from Southern California, and when I was going to school across town at USC, he was uh, a professor at uh, UCLA, uh, which really didn't mean anything especially, except that he had started his improvis improvisational group already, <coughs> And they made quite a, a, a <coughs> impact on the music scene in Los Angeles at that time. And because it, that group included the clarinet, I, of course, was, even as a student, uh, especially drawn to uh, attend performances. And I eventually met the clarinetist Richard DeFalo, who probably many of you know because he spent a great deal of time in Buffalo as well. So when it came time, uh, I was invited to be a creative associate in 1967 and to come up here and join this wonderful happening that was going on in uh, Buffalo. It was a, a, a wonderful and great honor. And to expand a little on what Charlie said about his, his openness to anything, um, there's a book by a fellow named Bruno Bartolozzi who gathered together uh, a, a book of extended techniques for woodwind players. And at the time, it was very new, and it's how you play three or four notes at a time, and you do this and you do that, and you create all kinds of different unconventional sounds on your instrument. And I had occasion uh, twice to go through that book with two different composers. One of them was Elliot Carter. I spent the afternoon with him once. This was after I'd been in Buffalo. Um, and Elliot went through that book example by example by example. And he insisted on writing down, uh, there was a fingering given for each example. And it was already well known that those fingerings work for some people and not others. And that you might, you'll get a multiphonic sound, more than one sound at a time, but it may not be the ones that are notated. <laughs> and so Elliot Carter wrote down took notes on every fingering in the clarinet section with me and wrote down what actually came out of my instrument, which you know, wouldn't have necessarily been the same as if Ed had done it. Um, with Lucas, he just went through that book and he said, well, okay, now, and we went, you know, we spent some time together, we sort of went from the book and now he says, take the barrel and put it on the bottom half of your clarinet. Uh, turn it upside down, play it out of your ear, do whatever you want, you know, it was just, <laughs> he was looking for anything that was new and uh, adventurous and different, uh, way beyond Bruno Bartolozzi's aims. And ultimately, as I said, I was, I was here for three years uh, in the late 60s with the Creative Associates, and I played in the uh, Brooklyn Philharmonic when he was conductor for six years, and I've been a member of the Dorian Wind Quintet for longer than I care to admit. And we've, we've collaborated many, many times over the years, and we had some wonderful experiences, which some other time we'll talk about. 
Thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> Marvelous. <laughs> uh, to my right is our Buffalo's Enfant <laughs> Chéri. <laughs> Carol. <laughs> yes, Carol, Carol, Carol Vincent. And uh, Carol, uh, you, you were uh, honored to, to work with Lucas and especially to, to be the to have dedicated to you uh, his wonderful Renaissance concerto uh, for flute and orchestra. And uh, um, I, we've just, as we were speaking backstage, we've just uncovered an archival recording of that premiere, as well as a beautiful interview with Lucas. But uh, perhaps you, you might uh, give us a capsule of what it was like to work with Lucas as that concerto was coming out. Well, thank you for calling me the Enfant Chéri because he prided himself on call, calling himself the Enfant Terrible. <laughs> and he was very, very open and demonstrative about that. Um, oh, where to begin? My first snapshot of Lucas was in our home. I was barely an adolescent, and my parents, Peggy and Joseph Winsens, who many of you know, and um, they had him over for a New Year's Eve party, and he was here alone. And we have the most hysterical photos of him with those funny hats on and blowing those little things. And little did I know when I had that first glimpse of him that he would be the towering, extraordinary, charismatic figure that I grew up with when we went to the concerts and I was sharing with Mills, I said, do you all remember when people got up in droves and left the hall? Do you remember that? It was very um, chic to just stand up and walk out, so please don't leave today. <laughs> um, and I remember gripping my mother's hand and saying, Mom, what's happening? Is this what's happening to music? And she just sort of rolled her eyes and said, just sit still. So we had that incredible diet, and then of course I went to the Creative Associate concerts, and that's how I met the Dorian Woodham Quintet. But through the process of the Renaissance Concerto, um, I had a, a really treasured moment that I think I shared with Charles the other day. And, I mean, he was so innovative. He said in about the Concerto, which he only finished like moments before the premiere. <laughs> in fact, we were together um, at Christmas time for a party, and I couldn't resist. I came up, and this is Christmas before the May premiere, and I said, Lucas, what's happening? And he said, oh, uh, Renaissance. I think I'm going to do Renaissance music. I said, great, great. When am I going to get it? Oh, don't worry. Then in April, he came running in. I was playing with the Milwaukee Symphony. He said, I finished it. I finished the Five Boys Fugue last night at 3 a.m. at the Pfister Hotel. Where he was when he was with the uh, Milwaukee Symphony. Oh, barely the ink was dry when we did the premiere. And he used to say, just be sure to tell everybody the right notes belong to Rameau, the wrong notes belong to me. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> we were in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was sort of a Rameau junkie at that time. I was listening to those wonderful recordings of the orchestra of the 18th century. Uh, of Rameau's uh, Boriad, maybe you remember um, that. Re it's a miraculous recording. So we were sitting on the back veranda of a lovely hotel, and it was very warm, and in those days we had Walkmans. I took, I was listening to it, and I put the headphones on Lucas, and I said, you've got to hear this. Oh my God, you've got to hear this. He heard about a minute or two, he was very quiet, and he removed the headphones, and he looked at me, and he sort of looked upward, you know, he. He didn't often look at you in the eye, and he was always in his thoughts. He said, do you think people are going to be listening to my music 350 years from now, like we're listening to Rambo? Yes, that's wonderful. So, you know, I, he was wonderful. He, he was very much like a, a parental figure. I think he thought of me as a daughter. In fact, the inscription on the score says, to the great flutist from New York and the little girl from Buffalo. <laughs> Indeed, how <I'm> fun! <laughs> uh, we have uh, to Carol's right is Charles Bornstein, a, a, a Buffalonian. Uh, uh, Charles, I remember you as as a very young teenager. Forgive me for the recollection. Uh, back I wasn't yet a teenager. Even <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, 
forgive me for that, but uh, nevertheless, I know that you have some recollections with, with Lucas. Charles has gone on to become a marvelous pianist, a, a musicologist. Uh, we keep reading about his discovery of Mahler's notations and scores and things of this kind, and he's a, a brilliant pianist and conductor. Uh, Charles, you have a couple of points you might share with us, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's delightful to be here and see this interest uh, that hasn't waned over the 40 or so years since it began in modern art in this city. I think the thing that uh, most affected me about uh, Lucas Floss was the fact that I was exposed to such uh, cutting edge modern music here that was going on nowhere else in America, or not at least in the with the regularity that it was here, that um, often in the 20th century, uh, composers that have gone uh, so modern as Lucas did often call this a language because the way of, ways of playing the extensive techniques as they were talking about um, with the wind instruments, and that's also true with the brass instruments. And this is new as it is, the first time you hear works where the instruments sound so distorted, it does become a kind of language. And to be immersed in this from the age of 12, not 13, um, um, uh, left this kind of musical vocabulary. For instance, I'm sure Charles Haupt could tell you that he grows his fingernails especially long when they play a piece by Sonatas, because you have to pluck the highest notes with your fingernail, which sounds a little bit like a woodblock. And uh, these kind of ideas of associating uh, sounds from one group to another and creating works that deal with sonority-related ideas that are, is very present in the music of Sinakis was a big, big, um, it had a big, big effect on me because I had heard it at such an early age. And it was shocking and brilliant uh, at that time, but no one from my experience of piano lessons and a few uh, Beethoven and Brahms sym symphony concerts with Joseph Cripps, who was indeed a, a masterful conductor and produced a beautiful uh, balance and ease with the orchestra that is still evident on any recordings, was such different with Lucas because his intensity was almost infantile, even as a conductor. And he was criticized uh, for this often, that it wasn't a real conducting technique. It was this grabbing of the sound or punching it. And um, these impulses are in all of the earlier music, the brutality or the primal qualities in Beethoven or even in Mozart that's so elegant. And it was this primal quality that Lucas really was able to pull out of classical music. And it was this quality that uh, he translated in the modern music or the, the modern music uh, uh, translated just through the way uh, it was written. And I think to grow up with this and have that kind of background of sounds, as I'm sure um, some of you must have from the age of 12 onwards as well, uh, was an indelible uh, source of uh, conducting modern music for myself, especially the Sinakis music, which people thought was um, so incredible. Uh, one of the performers today, uh, Tom Kohler, was on our one of a tour, three of our tours of Europe. And um, the, I think I could have never done this just as a routine or repertoire conductor and picking up, oh, there's a piece of Sinakis on the program today and learning it like that. It was this background, and Lucas uh, really gave you a lot of background to the works that were being played. I remember him explaining when he had come from Poland how Penderecki used slow glissandi in the strings against very quick uh, woodwind repeated notes against it. And that's one of the most simplest ideas, legato and staccato, in music against each other. But it was never quite done in this way. So to have his insight from such an early age, I really don't think I could have uh, had the insight that I do for the modern music and that modern impulse in the older music. Thank, Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much for everyone. Uh, to Charles Wright, as 
our friend David Felder, who is the uh, head of the composition department at, at UB. And, and David, I know that Lucas has meant a lot to you uh, over the years, and uh, I would be delighted if you could share one of those high moments with us, please. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's very nice to be here among such distinguished colleagues and people who've been really great friends of mine and Lucas and contemporary music here in Buffalo for many, many years. My head's just filled with uh, apocryphal tales. And you've heard a lot of uh, reminiscences. Many of these apocryphal tales I won't share with you today, but I will speak it with, about <coughs> Lucas as a, as a colleague. And I say colleague in a kind of strange way because it's marvelous to me that even though there's 30 some years difference between Lucas and I, he considered me to be his colleague. And this was astonishing to me when I was a young man. I'll tell you one apocryphal tale. I wrote my first orchestra piece when I was about 26 or 27. I had no prospects of having it played. I didn't know any conductors. And so I started talking to people to see if I could find somebody who would be interested. I thought maybe some conductor of a school orchestra or something like this. Somebody said, uh, send it to Lucas Foss. I didn't know Lucas Foss. I put in a little envelope, wrote a little letter, here's my first orchestra piece. I'd be really delighted if you would let me know what you think about it. Um, probably about six weeks later, to my um, great surprise, a letter came from Lucas Foss, handwritten. In this letter, he had read my score, there was no recording. This was, pardon me folks, this was in the days when composers would read scores at the piano. They didn't need CDs to. So Lucas read my score um, and he wrote back to me and he did the kind of thing that Nils refers to. He found what was essential in the, in the piece, he referred to it, he told me he loved it, he couldn't play it the next year, but would I be so good as to write a new piece for the Brooklyn Philharmonic for its first concert. And I thought, wow, this is really a great profession. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy to have chosen this profession. Ask me how many times it's happened since then. <laughs> so that's the first apocryphal tale that I have to tell with Lucas. And indeed, um, I showed up um, at that particular rehearsal and so forth and, and ran into Lucas, obviously, and he conducted my work. And marvelous and I became friends with Lucas. Um, subsequent to that, there were many, many other occasions. Um, I'll tell you one other occasion because one, when you were dealing with Lucas and when, you, when we are dealing with Lucas and his legacy, he is underappreciated as a composer. He is underappreciated as a kind of presence that had a kind of importance to the scene in the 1960s and 70s, particularly in American music. This was a place where we had warring camps that, that was going on. Lucas was a musician of no limitation. Imagine this. Most of us, I'll speak for myself, I don't want to speak for others on this panel, but most of us make a virtue out of our limitations. In other words, we find out, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do this, so that's where I'm going. And we find a way to make our own language and our own work. What do you do if you don't have those limitations. Well, what Lucas did was he embraced diversity way ahead of the way that we use that word now. And he didn't think about diversity in terms of the way people look or what socioeconomic class you come from or so forth. It was diversity of ideas. And he was able to penetrate to the core of those ideas and that was reflected in his own work, it was reflected in his programming, it was reflected in everything he did. And he embraced, he did not imitate. And in the 1960s, when all of these warring camps were basically uh, involved in mutual assur mutually assured dis uh, destruction, you had the Babbitt camp, and you had the Steve Wright camp, and you had other camps, um, Lucas did it all. And people had no idea what to make of this. And yet, that's where we are now. Where we are now is that we have a kind of freedom to pursue the various areas of the contemporary music world, and they are extremely wide-ranging. People like Jacob Druckmann said, without the Baroque variations, no windows from him, 
None of the work of Luciano Berrio that was so important in the later 60s, and we might say none of the opening toward the music of the past that we had. In Lucas's program, he could do Xenakis and Steve Reich on the same program. This was unheard of. It was unheard of at the time, and people did not know what to make of it. Now, the second apocryphal tale having to do with his talent and abilities. In 1988, I was asked to program a music festival for the State University of New York statewide. So all of the 64 campuses, imagine that, you're supposed to make a program to involve 64 campuses. So we tried to pick a variety of different things, and of course I had to pick a keynote lecturer, and that could only be Lucas Fox. So I asked Lucas to speak, and he was speaking to a wide variety of musicians, from young students to extraordinarily crusty musicology faculty members. <laughs> so Lucas showed up a few minutes ahead of time, and I'd given him this charge, oh, probably two months before. And he walked in, and he said, oh, David, hi, what am I doing? <laughs> and I said, you're going to talk about, but, 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 but here's the title of the lecture that you gave me two months ago. He said, oh. And what he ended up talking about was the slow movement of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony. And he did it completely off the top of his head, and he talked about interpretation. He sat down at the piano, and he basically said, well, what did Beethoven mean? He played the opening 15 or 20 bars of reduction about 10 different ways, each one entirely convincing. It was a brilliant tour de force. I've never seen anything like it to this day. That is Lucas Fox. Vintageurus. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to my far right is my dear friend, Jan Williams. Jan and I um, knew Lucas. Uh, we traveled together, played many chamber concerts, recorded Lucas Echoing with Lucas at the keyboard. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, I could go on. Uh, Jan is also was uh, honored by Lucas, as Carol was with her concerto. Lucas wrote a wonderful concerto for percussion dedicated to Jan Williams. Uh, of all of us on stage, I, I dare say that Jan probably has more vignettes in, that he could share than, um, than the rest of us, but uh, Jan, if we could have one or two, please, dear. Yes, uh, I promise to be sure. Uh, I sat down this morning actually at home and thought maybe I should jot down a few things that I would like to mention. And I'm staring at this blank piece of paper. And I honestly I didn't know where to begin. So I I, uh, I will say that Lucas brought me to Buffalo. I was 23 years old, and uh, with my wife Diane, she played in the Philharmonic, and I came with the first group of creative associates. Lucas took a real flyer on me because the other percussionist that he had hired, he had worked with very often, John Bergman. And I'm sure that Lucas hired me because John said, he's good, I've taken it, fine. Uh, the, my first real, uh, I mean, I worked with him for all these years. We traveled together, we, we played uh, Echoey. I remember the first time I played his piece, Echoey, early on, uh, was filling in for someone John couldn't play it. We played it down in Jamestown. And I sweat bullets. I think we have one rehearsal on the piece. It's, it's a gigantic piece. But in any case, after that performance, I must have did, did a pretty good job because from that point on, Lucas relied on me for a lot of his uh, touring and, and playing. He was a wonderful, wonderful person by all means, just the most caring, the most. Uh, he never forgot about you, he never forgot about us when he left Buffalo. He would call several times a year to check and see how we're doing. He, he was just the most, um, he was the most important person in my life in terms of uh, my career. Uh, I could tell stories about Lucas and traveling. Uh, certainly the most memorable uh, events for me as a performer was playing with Ed and Lucas and a cellist by the name of Douglas Davis. Uh, on tours in Europe playing his piece Echoey and other pieces. A memorable story at Copenhagen, remember? We're driving from the, air, from the uh, hotel to the recording studio, the radio in, in Copenhagen, and he said, 
Hey guys, I'm short. We're short ten minutes of music for this uh, recording. Uh, and I said, he, he said, but I have an idea. Here's what we're going to do. But at the time we reached the recording studio, he had outlined this piece that we were going to put together. We put it together in about an hour. It was called non-improvisation. We we worked about an hour. He said, okay, Ed, you're going to do this. Jan, we'll do this. I'm going to play Bach on the piano. You're going to play huge clusters on the uh, on the, on the or clouds of sound oh, so. and organ, and the, and the Bach is going to peek its way through and submerge. It's, the outline law, we worked on it, we recorded it. It's terrifically successful. We played it many times. We recorded commercially for recording companies. Uh, from that to his pieces like Echo, which is so completely thoroughly composed, every detail, every uh, thing. I mean, he could do absolutely in music, it just it just oozed from every one of his his pores. He uh, he was my champion, and uh, I'll never forget him. And I I, I must say that uh, I'll miss him terribly. But I'm um, sure that you're going to enjoy hearing his music today. I think it's it's, it's a wonderful group of colleagues who have come together to to honor his, uh, Lucas and his life. And uh, thanks for all, all for coming. Uh, Ed, turn it back to you. Yes, thank you, Jan. Wonderful uh, recollections. And uh, yes, I remember this piece called Non-Improvisation very well. Uh, I, you know, truth be known, when we finally came to record Non-Improvisation, also in that same uh, recording, on that same recording, is Echoe, one of the most difficult chamber pieces ever written. I mean, as Jan knows very well, and Doug Davis, cellist played. I was the lucky guy that played clarinet on that recording. So you would think, with such a major piece, that this would be the primary purpose of that recording, and that would get most of the effort, right? Right. We actually, on that recording, was non-improvisation. And as Jan just described, there is a cloud of sound. No kidding, I think we, re Lucas could not get that cloud in tune. If we worked on that, Jan, do you remember? In that recording session, to, uh, using electronic organ and all kinds of everything, slight clarinet I devised for him, you were playing the gong as well, and anything. He worked to tune this dissonant, cos dissonant cosmos cloud for four hours. And we're waiting, by the way, Echoey is the big deal of the day, and we're, we haven't even touched it yet. But it, and then we recorded it for about an hour. So five hours into the session, we begin to record Echoey at the time. But he cared so much about detail that no one else on the planet would have spent four hours tuning a cloud of sound than Lucas Voss. Uh, the, the point non-improvisation brings up a, a point. When Lucas, uh, the, the Philharmonic, and uh, I had a, uh, uh, celebrated the music of Lucas Voss about seven or eight years ago, and during which time uh, the Buffalo Chamber Music Society performed, uh, uh, sponsored one of his, uh, the premiere of one of his quartets. Terrific event. And so I interviewed Lucas before the chamber concert, and one thing, <laughs> excuse me, led to another, but uh, something came up, one of his remarks, and, and I was prompted to ask a question I never, it, never heard uh, addressed with Lucas, and I thought, well, I should ask it now, and it was very simple. I said, Lucas, um, you just mentioned improvisation and all that it takes and the requirement, the creative challenges and everything. Is there a difference between improvisation and composition? Oh, yes, good question. Big difference, he said. He said, when we improvise, we're working with something we already know. When we compose, we're creating something that we don't know. Wonderful insight into the, uh, I, I think it's a profound insight, but it gives you an, an idea of the extent of the, 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 the true quest uh, of the man in music, and, and using the word quest, I'm recalling that the first piece he ever performed in Buffalo was The Unanswered Question by Charles Ives, and the, the question still keeps coming up. And just with Lucas, uh, as we all know here who knew him, just as you think you're about to get near the end of the, uh, answering that question, he changes the question. <laughs> and so there we have it.
But thank you all. I think we're a little running out of time. So. We have a few minutes. Good. Good. Excellent. Oh yes. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Jerry. We have here a um, uh, member of the panel. It cannot be with us today. Oh. It's our dear Jesse Levine, who who passed just a few weeks ago. And uh, we have a recording of uh, a brief uh, interview he gave on, on Lucas and Lucas music. Thank you. You will have noticed in the uh, notes of the program that we were, our intentions were to pursue Lucas's influences and the people who he influenced himself. One of his influences and one of his teachers was him. And Jesse Levine, who was the principal of the Orvos of the Philharmonic for a number of years, we all know Jesse Levine. And um, subsequently, I moved to Yale, I taught at Yale, a professor at Yale, Viola. I had an illustrious career. It was uh, laid, now laid low by uh, father, father, father Time, picked up cancer when he passed on. And he was supposed to play the Hidden Mithiel with Sonata, with the Miles of Viola and Piano. And uh, he's not playing it, obviously, and it's not on the program, but he recorded, I believe, an interview. Yes, that's right. We have a recorded right. interview. And I think that, uh, I think yes, thank you. We, we're going to play it. We're going to play it right yeah. now, I believe. Uh, Don, or if the audio engineer could cue it up, please. <laughs> this is Jesse Levine speaking about Lucas Ross.
we went on a tour to on a tour to McGill University in, in uh, Montreal. It was late winter, early spring. We were all stuffed into this car, and somehow the face decided that Lucas was going to be driving. <laughs> and we entered the campus, and we knew the building. We could see the music building where we were going to. And uh, no matter how we negotiated the roads, we had, it was like being, you know, in, the, in, in a forest. We ended up in the exact same place. <laughs> now, the, 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 the music building was maybe three, four, three hundred yards away. It was quite a distance. We, we were separated from the music building by this soggy lawn, by the very pristine lawn, but soft and washy. Well, Lucas said, this is ridiculous. I just I can't, I can't do this over and over again. He just veered off the road, went onto the lawn, went directly, which is how he did everything in life. He went directly to the, to the music department, and I, looked, I was the only one who looked behind <laughs> And I look behind and I see these 12 inch tracks leading right across this beautiful soggy lawn to the music department. And I wanted to almost sign Lucas's name to that because it was a different kind of art. I mean, again, Lucas manifested his genius graphically this time. And this was a little insight into one of his rare skills. Wonderful driver. <laughs> Conducting, and we were playing Paradigm at the, at the Albright Knox Gallery uh, up in the court there, just right across the street uh, some years ago. And this, by now, Lucas had given up driving. Actually, driving gave up Lucas. Yeah. Uh, he, was, uh, he was in driving school so many times. It <laughs> really, really happened. They finally uh, said, we don't think this is a good idea for you. Um, uh, no kidding. And, uh, but, uh, so Lucas needed to be driven around, and we're already now in the mid-70s, I would say. It's about the timing of it. And so I was uh, going to uh, drive him back to the Lenox Hotel uh, to where he was staying uh, that particular week. And, uh, but uh, Lucas said to me, he said, Ed, uh, do you mind if we take Seymour Knox uh, home? Uh, and I said, why, why sure, that, that'd be fine. I'll drop him off as well doesn't live far, no, no problem. Well, Lucas, this was after the concert, during the reception, he introduced me to Seymour Knox, and Lucas disappeared. And uh, the place is thinning out quite a bit. Now, finally, there are just a few people left. Seymour Knox is looking a little nervous and a little worried. He said, gee, he said, I just had some folks trying to find Lucas. Uh, he said, uh, we're, you, you, you don't think he's left yet? I said, oh, no. I said, I, I, I can find him. So I. I knew exactly where he was, and Jen would know, Charlie would know, and he would work with Lucas. He was on the phone. He was in the, uh, in, in the phone booth at the Albright Knox Gallery because Lucas could never go 10 minutes without making a phone call someplace. He used to drive us nuts with that, as a matter of fact. He wanted us to choose a route so there are the, the maximum phone booths along the way. <laughs> and that made me not actually, actually did. Well, Charles Warner once commented the guy must have a string that actually was dying. Yeah, it's <laughs> remarkable. So I found Lucas, and uh, I ran up back upstairs to the court, and I said, uh, Seymour, he, he'll be right off the phone. He's coming. He said, yeah. He said, well, he said, you, you managed to find him. He said, uh, you're in the Philharmonic, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, tell me, um, uh, you know, I've read in the paper that there have been some complaints about his programming and this <coughs> controversial. He said, but how do, the, how do the players feel about his his basic musicianship, actually, though. He would, uh, Seymour Knox was quite asking a very, very serious question. I said, Mr. Knox, I said, yes, he's controversial. And Lucas is always, everything's spinning around about him, but all the players on stage, even the ones who complain, they complain because they wish he would devote his life to Debussy and to, and to Brahms and to Beethoven instead of doing all this experimental work because uh, he has such a profound gift. And uh, Knox said to me, he said, oh, I'm so pleased to hear that. He said, because Lucas Foss is the only genius I ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful remark from the, from, a, from the man who met yeah. a few along the way. Uh, I, 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 we're, we're about 10 minutes before the hour, are we all right? Yeah, maybe we should. Uh, 
why, yes. I really have a story that Chris told me before he died about his driving. It's funny. He, he was appointed by the United States government to uh, take Shostakovich around during the composer's uh, conference between the USSR and America. I think it took place at Madison Square Garden. And Lucas took Shostakovich back to his apartment and played a piece of his, which Shostakovich didn't like. And Lucas then drew, drove him back to Madison Square Garden. And when they arrived there, Lucas said, well, we're here. And Shostakovich looked at it and said, well, I like your music better than your driving. <laughs> We could tell that if we could all get start to, to collect these vignettes, it could go for not for hours but for days without repeating the story. Uh, the, 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 the lightweight anecdotes are abundant, they're all over the map, but uh, he was at the same time a very serious musician about everything he did, and, uh, and so we pay homage uh, to Lucas today. Thank you all. Thanks.